get started. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the October briefing of the South Bay Cogs legislative, uh, legislative District Staff Briefing. And um, my name is Olivia Valentine. I am chair of the South Bay Cog and also council member of the city of Hawthorne. Welcome everyone. And um, we hope you enjoy this morning's meeting. So I'm going to start right away with Jackie, who's going to give us the program update. And thank you very much. Uh, we sent out to you uh, before the meeting started with the meeting notice, our legislative matrix, which included some of the legislation that we were monitoring this year. Um, not all of it, because when it passed, we took it off our list. But I wanted to very, very briefly run through the, the uh, PowerPoint that was sent to you. And uh, I don't know if it's up on the screen. Did you, were you able to? Wait a minute. I'm, able, we're, I'm able to see it. Okay, great. Okay, so um, if we can just keep going. Uh, this is our, since July, we're gonna talk about these issues, but before we go to the next slide, um, the housing principles, the legislation, we're gonna be setting up a list of principles that we think are important for any housing legislation. And then we're gonna be setting up meetings with our legislators because we think that uh, we continually are getting the same kinds of directives and they just don't speak to the issues that are in the South Bay. So we will be doing that in the next month or so and uh, try and meeting, uh, calling each office. So please expect us to be contacting you. The last thing on this chart is we've had two special meetings for our elected officials on the role of public safety and uh, with guest speakers talking about what elected officials sh should be asking their police chiefs, um, how they should uh, understand the culture of their department. And it's really been, I think, a very, very um, informative exercise for everybody. And now we've asked our, we've given our elected officials about 20 questions to ask their police so that they can really create a dialogue and understand that, that what's going on in their own departments. So we're pretty proud of that initiative. Uh, let's move on. Our fiber network is, this is the fiber network. As you can see, there's a ring, uh, not exactly one you can put on your finger, but a ring that connects all of the cities. And the ring is uh, allows the fiber to go in either direction. So it's uh, reliable and redundant and uh, it is up and it is running. Next slide. Okay. Um, 16 sites are connected. We're gonna have 35 sites by the end of the year. It costs $6.9 million and the subregion paid all of the capital costs through our Measure M funding. We've not only got our cities, but we've got the participating agencies. You can see there, Water, Workforce Investment Board, Health Agencies. We're very excited about it. And, um, and Metro is a significant part where we'll be able to do real, tra real traffic, um, real-time traffic understanding. Uh, minimum service is $1,000 a month for one gigabit, which is much more than cities had for much less than they were paying in, in almost all cases. And now we're working at applications that we can provide for cities where they can provide better customer service and greater efficiency. Let's move on. Uh, this is the most important thing for you today. Please put down November 17th at 10.30. We're gonna have a virtual connection celebration. We've been waiting for so long to thank the people that helped us get the fiber network together. We're getting invitations out by um, virtually as well, by email. And uh, we wanna have you all join us as we have our connection celebration. Go on. Uh, Metro, this is real short and sweet. As we all know, they have a large deficit. We're gonna hopefully find out what the funding estimate is at the end of October, because we have no idea whether we have money for new projects or how we're gonna be able to fund the projects that we already have. So um, fully funding our current projects is the priority, but we'll, we won't know until the end of the month at least. Next. Homeless services, we've developed education mod modules so that we can train city staff. Uh, they're gonna be completed by the end of this month. And then by the end of December, we're gonna have strategies for, pe to, for people to experience, who are experiencing homelessness. And we're trying to develop training so that people really know how to be positive and interact well when they are faced with a homeless person that they can really, really do the, 
uh, so many people are befuddled and don't know what the proper response is. Safe parking, there's a lot going on in District 15 in LA. We're really proud of that, but we're looking for sites, other sites throughout the South Bay. And then the next slide, we're piloting a project called Project uh, Home Share South Bay. We're very excited about this. It's launching, uh, it actually launched yesterday, but there's a la little launch party today at, at uh, 1230. Um, it's a pilot to match homeowners with compatible housemates. Silvernest is an online sharing platform and it's going to be, uh, uh, it's going to uh, vet the homeowner with the housemate. And hopefully we're gonna find people who um, are at risk of losing their home or maybe just recently homeless who can help somebody that has um, too much space and would love to have a companion. And uh, there's, uh, please follow this. And if you know of anybody, we really want you to refer them to us. We think this is gonna be a really important program. Next. Uh, there's no date for the homeless count yet. Our next meeting is November 4th. If you haven't been to one of our homeless task forces, it's a really informative meeting on what's going on in the South Bay. Next. Senior services, uh, we have me meals are still going on at senior centers and virtual classes and the libraries are offering curbside services. Our next meeting of seniors is December 1st. And those are really very informative as well. Um, we have great speakers and great discussion. Let's move on. In, in the environmental area, you can see we have a lot of programs. We've fit, uh, we're working on adaptation with city vulnerability assessments, water saving programs for businesses and disadvantaged communities. Um, and energy efficiency programs. We're doing a lot of virtual tours and virtual forums. Next. And then our general assembly, please save the date, March 18th. We are going to do this virtually. We're starting our sponsorships and preparing our program. Um, I think I covered everything. Next slide. Thank you. And our next meeting will be in 2021. So um, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, that's the report. Thank you so much, Jackie. So now we're going to move on. Um, so you, you have already had the opportunity to identify any city issues you wanted to bring before the uh, legislative representatives of the legislators who are here today. So um, unless there is something specific that you want to ask now, I'm going to move on so that we can move ahead with the program. And if you have questions, keep them in mind and ask your legislators as they speak. Um, Congress member Ted Liu, you're up first. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me and want to uh, thank all of you for participating. I thought I'd give you an update on uh, the stimulus package in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> so as you know, at the beginning of this pandemic, Congress passed four bipartisan laws to address the pandemic. We got funding out to American families, <clears throat> to school districts, to hospitals, to local uh, counties and cities and states. And my view is all of that was uh, necessary, uh, but not sufficient to address the scale of this pandemic. And that's why the House of Representatives on May 15th passed the HEROES Act, which is a $3.4 trillion second round of stimulus. Unfortunately, the White House and the Senate twiddled their thumbs for most of that time and didn't do anything. Now they're scrambling to see if we can come up for a deal. So in the meantime, we negotiated against ourselves and passed another version of the HEROES Act of $2.2 trillion last month. Both of those bills are on Mitch McConnell's desk. He could send any one of those two directly uh, for a floor vote and then to the president and we would get a second round of stimulus. So one of the issues that the Senate Republicans and the White House are opposed to is funding for state and local governments. And so that's something uh, that we're not gonna relent on in the Democratic caucus. We're gonna keep fighting for it. Uh, our view is that if you don't provide significant funding to state and local government, then you're gonna have massive layoffs of frontline responders, such as police officers and firefighters and other folks uh, who have been fighting this pandemic. And that is uh, one of the major sticking points. So hopefully we can get Senate Republicans in the White House uh, to uh, relent on that issue. Speaker Pelosi uh, continues to have discussions with the White House. The holdup seems more to be with the Senate Republicans. 
And what I don't understand is why they don't listen to Donald Trump. Uh, he, as you know, last week said he was walking away from the negotiation and then literally uh, within 12 hours after the months pushback said, no, he's gonna come back in and, and keep negotiating. And then he recently uh, started tweeting last couple of days that he wanted an even bigger stimulus. So while his behavior is bizarre, his current negotiations based on what he said is he wants to go big or go home. So we're trying to follow, in fact, what Donald Trump is saying, and we want to go big as well. And the holdup really is uh, with Republicans in the Senate. Uh, so we're going to keep putting pressure on. Hopefully we can get a deal before the elections. If we don't, uh, then my view is if the voters flip the White House and flip the uh, Senate, then we will e get an even bigger deal early next year. Uh, with that, uh, thanks for inviting me and thanks for all that you do. Thank you, Congressman uh, Lou. Um, do, are there questions for the Congressman? Are there any questions for the Congressman? I, um, please use, your, use the red, raise hand icon. David, do you see any questions? I do not. Okay. All right, we're going to move on um, to the state offices. We're going to hear from the state representatives. Um, we'll ask the state representatives to limit your discussion to 10 minutes and uh, the, I mean, the, the legislators to limit their discussion to 10 minutes. And um, if there are, if there is staff here, um, you will have three minutes. So first there is uh, from the Capitol, uh, State Senator Ben Allen. Hi there. Um, would you mind, I thought I was going on at 9.30, so I, I'm just finishing one thing on my baby here. Would you mind going to Al first and I'll be right there? I'll go right after Al. I have no problem at all. Um, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> well, with the, it's okay. The, um, if it's not, I can I, I could be ready in like two seconds. I just got to. That's on. okay. Um, <laughs> uh, we have uh, uh, Assembly Member Patrick O'Donnell. Perfect. Hey, Patrick. Is he here? No, Olivia. I think the next one. I think um, I don't know who's here. Uh, Autumn Burke might be. I, I know it's here. It's Autumn. I'm here. If you want me to go, I can go before Ben. Well, Senator Bradford, Bradford is here. Senator oh, let's go. Bradford's here. I'm sorry, Sen uh, Senator Senator Bradford, State Senator Bradford, are you here? Yes, he is. He's muted. You're muted, Senator. I am here, present and accounted for. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Um, th thank uh, the South Bay uh, Council of Governments for this opportunity to speak to you this morning as we have done uh, on an annual basis, and it's good to see many of our friends or my friends, uh, um, even virtually. Uh, as many of you know, I served on the Gardena City Council for 12 years, and I was a member of this caucus. So I understand the important work uh, that you do each and every day. And I've always stressed that the work that you do on a local level far exceeds uh, many times what we do on the state and national level. So I thank you for this opportunity just to give you a brief highlight of some of the things things that I've been working on and we as a state um, during this crazy uh, year, uh, we all have to agree these are being uh, some of the most unprecedented times that we face as a state and as a nation and even as a, a, a planet uh, as it relates to this pandemic and what it has uh, meant to uh, the, the economy, to healthcare, to all those things that are critically important, uh, criminal justice. and um, First, want to report that we, we balanced the budget in spite of all of that. Uh, we pa balanced uh, and passed the on-time state budget uh, with no uh, cuts, uh, no tax increases. It did uh, require us to um, dip down into our rainy day fund uh, that we had saved under both uh, Gavin Newsom and uh, Jerry Brown of over uh, fifty-four billion dollars, and we had to. Uh, spend a lot of that money in order to uh, get a, ba a budget that was balanced and on time, but one that keeps California whole and uh, continues with the priorities that we've set forth. At the beginning of this year, I introduced 20 pieces of legislation. Um, 
but as we know, the pandemic hit in the first. Uh, so to speak, and when we came back in May, we were asked to reduce our bill package down to those uh, pieces of legislation that was COVID related uh, or uh, having some kind of direct relationship or indirect relationship with uh, the recovery plan. I was during that period of time, I was also appointed as co-chair of the Senate Economic Recovery Task Force, myself and Senator Bob Hertzberg. And through that, we worked with uh, eight other of our colleagues to come up with legislation to help uh, address some of the problems that uh, were caused and are still, that still exists through COVID. One of the biggest issues I was most proud of was uh, the Tenant Landlord uh, Protection Act. Uh, I introduced that in uh, May and then uh, Again, due to the bill reduction, we made it a collaborative effort and moved it from a Senate bill to a uh, assembly bill. And it was uh, AB 3088 that the governor signed and it provides protection not only to tenants, but to landlords as well. And many folks were always uh, stating, we've got to make sure we protect our tenants, which is so true, but we also have to protect our landlords. And many times people think of a landlord as some large wealthy conglomerate, but many of the landlords are our frontline essential workers or mom and pop uh, owners who might own a duplex, might own a fourplex, but they go to work every day. There are mailmen, there are teachers, there are uh, bus drivers who just happen to have invested well. And we want to make sure that they were protected too, because if a landlord is foreclosed on, everybody is hurt. Not only does that individual lose their property, but the tenants also lose their housing. So uh, it was a balanced approach that uh, gives uh, relief to the tenant, uh, asking them to pay at least 25% of their rent uh, between now and the first of the year. And under uh, penalty of perjury, if they can't, uh, uh, they would have to sign a document under penalty of perjury if they could meet that 25%. And then provide a tax credit and relief for the property owner. Because again, the worst thing that could happen is that you keep a tenant in the building, but at the same time, the mortgage doesn't go away. So we were also working with our lending institutions, I chair banking and financial institutions in the Senate. And we were trying to devise all kinds of plans to have mortgage protection and forbearance to make sure that uh, landlords are not foreclosed on during this period of time. So uh, we're happy that uh, the governor signed that piece of legislation. There's still much work to be done there, but it's a critical piece. Um, also, um, you guys want to talk about um, the environment. And uh, as a person who spent six years of my life uh, working for both LA Conservation Corps and um, uh, being a solid waste director for the city of Compton, uh, it's uh, an area that I've spent a lot of time. I've passed numerous pieces of legislation that's had impacts on our environment. But I think the most challenging issue to our environment right now is homelessness. And if we cannot put the focus on people who are sleeping under trees and let that take precedence over people uh, saving a tree, then I think we as Californians, we as Americans have our priorities wrong. So housing is one of the critical issues that I'm gonna be working on uh, as we move forward. It's some of the things, again, that ties into uh, AB 3088 of making sure that we protect and keep people housed. That's one of the uh, most critical things. And as I've stated throughout my entire life, I don't know anyone who wants dirty air, dirty water, or dirty soil. But I have yet to run into a single person who says, you know, Steve, this is what keeps me up at night. What keeps me up at night is how I keep a roof over my head. How do I have health care for my, my family? How do I get to and from work without a car? Uh, all those things, how do, can I be safe as a person of color driving down the street, fearful of law enforcement and what we've seen not only here in this immediate region, throughout the state and out throughout this nation. So um, those are the issues that we, uh, we that need to be addressed. I will be addressing those. So um, uh, we're at a critical uh, standpoint, uh, uh, turning point right now in, in this state and in this nation. Uh, and so the other issue of concern is criminal justice and uh, reform and police reform. And we're lying to ourselves if it's an issue that doesn't need to be addressed. I was happy to author uh, SB 731, 
which was pleased to certification. Unfortunately, that bill did not get a vote on the last night of uh, legislative session due to time constraints and other shenanigans that were played. But California is only uh, one of only five states in the nation that doesn't have police certification. And police certification is a simple method of being able to decertify bad officers. Not good officers, bad officers. So I will be reintroducing that measure. I would hope that the call would find this of critical importance because if people don't feel safe in their communities from not only the criminal element and uh, uh, law enforcement element, then we have no society. And we all have to admit there are bad elected officials, there are bad teachers, there are bad doctors, there are bad lawyers. We have to admit that bad police officers exist. And the rank and file, the majority of men and women who put that uniform on every day, that badge on, and do their job in an honorable way. We are having a transmission problem. Media outliner of all We're having a transmission problem. Senator Bradford, you're frozen. We're having a transmission problem. Do you know if that's coming from your end? Mm -hmm. uh, we don't, I don't know how we fix it. I think we, I don't know if we can move on or. Cops, the bad cops. And we all know that it relates to race because it's poor people and people of color who have been impacted. We found out they're our frontline essential workers. They're the ones with the poorest health care, the fewest access to doctors. We've seen the digital divide in uh, these communities. So um, we need to work on all of those things. And we see uh, through, like I say, this pandemic that the communities that have been impacted most are primarily our, our lower income communities and our uh, communities of color. So uh, we have to make that a priority. We have to put that at the uh, top of our list if we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna move California forward and we're gonna move the station forward. So, um, and uh, what else, what else, what else? Uh, and that's that's pretty much it. Unless you have any questions for me, uh, I think that's what. Am I at my ten minutes? I think so, Senator Bradford. But uh, there may be questions for you. Are okay. there questions I'm, for the senator? Chair uh, Valentine, uh, could I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. If if you, um, I'm, I want to ask you if if there are people in the audience who have a question, please use the raise hand icon on your on your uh, on your screen. Go ahead, please, Ms. Huff. Yes, uh, Britt Huff with the City of Rolling Hills Estates. Thank you, Senator Bradford, for being here this morning. Uh, appreciate your, your input. And following up on um, your latest point there, I, I was very concerned about this uh, lead article in the LA Times yesterday, front page, top of the fold, about the number of injuries that are being caused by um, alternative uh, use uh, other than using bullets, uh, using foam pellets and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if you saw the news report about uh, those who were celebrating the, the Lakers win and uh, it apparently got a little over enthusiastic. But, uh, you know, people were being shot by these foam pellets. Uh, normally, this should be, I would think, a local issue we we hope our police departments and sheriffs would would uh, you know respond to the the interests of the public and local officials but uh, you know people are really being permanently damaged by these this article was about this young man who was shot in the eye and his uh, the eye socket was shattered and uh, the the eye, ball itself exploded and he's left blind and uh, deformed and um, this is a concern or is there anything at the state level that's dealing with this sort of thing to try to help those uh, local agencies who aren't responding very quickly uh, yes uh, matter of fact I think it was uh, uh, my colleague the governor just signed a bill uh, banning even law enforcement from uh, using uh, chemical agents and rubber bullets uh, in an unsafe manner. Um, that's something that's been looked at on both sides, not only uh, limiting the use and discretion of, for law enforcement, but the general public as well. So I don't know who did the shooting there, but uh, yes, that was well, part of some of the- 
police reform uh, measure that was signed by the governor. Even uh, Senator Bob Archuleta also had a uh, bill as to how one can address law enforcement, uh, moving them away from the military type fatigues to have a far less intimidating presence on the community. So no, that's the issue that has been looked at and uh, a measure has been signed by the governor. Well, it, apparently the enforcement of it hasn't reached the local level. This was the LAPD. Um, and, you know, in a case like this, you're having police officers basically um, give someone a life sentence without a jury when they're left uh, blind and permanently damaged like that. that. So the bill was just signed, so I think it doesn't go into effect until January. But no, uh, that oh. was one of the major pieces of police reform, chemical, chemical agents and the rubber projectiles and things of that nature that we know have permanent damage. Everybody's always just a rubber bullet. As you say, someone get hit in the eye, get hit in the throat and the neck. Uh, no, it does long-term and permanent damage. So no, that was a piece of legislation and, uh, that was signed by the governor. Oh, well, that's a, a good news. I, I do uh, hope that we as local officials can uh, speak out and try to get this uh, implemented locally before January 1st, because this sort of thing seems to be going on, uh, you know, irrespective of the legislation. But thank you for that. No problem. And, and what I felt and also just to segue back to the pandemic was SB 1447, my business tax credit. I want all the small businesses which make up the lion's share of employment in all our communities. Uh, we have, I secured $100 million uh, for small businesses that had a 50% loss in revenue uh, from July 1 until the end of the year. And they can apply for that uh, tax credit for every new hire or rehire to their businesses. So that was one of the uh, issues of great concern to uh, many of our local businesses. Uh, Senator Bradford, the uh, SB 1447, how do small businesses uh, get, uh, get access to the information for that? Uh, just go to my website, uh, call, uh, uh, like I said, that bill will go in effect uh, come December 1st. They can start applying for the tax credit and, uh, and it's on the governor's website as well. And or you can All call right. my office. Thank you. Uh huh. Are there any other questions for the senator? Thank you, Senator Bradford. Thank you. Thank you for all the work that you guys are doing. Um, all right. I think Senator Ben Allen is here now. Hey there. Yeah. Thank you Hello. so much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your for your patience. And and um, you know, Autumn of course has a has a little one as well and understands. Uh, and thank you to my colleague uh, Senator Bradford for the for the great overview of all the work that's been uh, that, that's been happening. And let me just start by apologizing for my informality with this cap, but I feel as though in the spirit of uh, thinking globally and acting locally, that if this wearing this baseball hat, uh, you know, even infinitesimally contributes to the Dodgers historic comeback starting tonight, it will be worth, uh, it will be worth it. So uh, I, I appreciate your forbearance and, and um, go, go blue. Go blue. <laughs> go blue. <laughs> I, you know, we're, we're, it just, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's like, it's like losing your bills, right, Steve? I mean, you and I know what it's like on the last day, you know, you're watching the team go down the way they did, but, uh, but we're, we're, we're gonna come back. We're gonna come back politically. We're gonna come back um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a baseball manner too. So anyhow, I wanna thank everybody uh, always for, for your engagement. I, I obviously love being at this meeting in person in Torrance where we all get to sit around the big table together and talk some shop. Uh, this is obviously not what we all wanted to do uh, in 2020, but this is the fate that this is the lot that fate has given us. Um, let me, of course, uh, you know, just build on a few things that, that uh, Senator Bradford talked about. And, and first of all, just I think it would be I think we would be remiss if we didn't mention um, the fact that we've got a big election coming up on November 3rd. And and um, and I just want to make sure that the people are are uh, aware of all of the options that are out there to vote. And I just want to ask everybody to remind your constituents that voting is one of our most basic and fundamental rights. I want to implore everybody on this call to do whatever you can to get the word out about the importance of voting and also the importance of understanding the system that we have, because it's a little different than in the past, both structurally and also because of COVID. And I think most of you know this, but I do think it bears repeating and I'm happy to, to, to you know, I think anybody on this call would be happy to answer specific questions about the system. But 
Um, but the first thing to say is that there's basically three different ways that you can vote. You can vote by mail, where you take the ballot that you've received in the mail and just pop it right back in the letterbox. You can take that ballot to a drop box, and these drop boxes are now all over town. You can also take your ballot or vote in person at a vote center. And there will be vote centers that'll be open for 11 days before election day, and there will be others that will be open four or five days before election day. Um, if you are planning on voting by mail, I just want to, I, I can't say enough how important it is to get that ballot in early. Uh, every vote will be counted as long as you get your ballot in postmarked by election day. However, uh, we all know that the Postal Service is going to be under tremendous strain this year. And if you want to make sure that your vote is counted as part of the, the first tally that goes up at 830 at night on election night, which of course is an important thing because it helps to you know, it, it's, it's part of the process. It helps to shape the conversation. If you're going to vote by mail, I, I strongly encourage you to get that ballot in uh, early. Um, obviously, if you want to vote in the vote center, that's great. Um, I would encourage people to, you know, go if you're going to vote in the vote center, go in, maybe not, don't go in on election day, go in before. We just want to make sure that we space out the process enough in ways that will be safe on the COVID side, uh, but that will also um, make sure that they don't get overloaded. Uh, we did see some problems in March. And we want to make sure we avoid that from happening. So we want to encourage people to not think of election day as election day, but really almost like election month, election week. There's lots and lots of different ways to vote. We've decided to make this as convenient as possible. The other great thing, by the way, you don't have to vote at your nearest vote center if you want to vote in person. You don't have to drop your ballot off at your nearest uh, Dropbox location. You know, last time in, in, in March, uh, you know, I was with my wife. We were seeing a show downtown and we went and voted at the Kenneth Hahn Hall of Administration, and I don't live anywhere near there, but it happened to be incredibly convenient to where we happened to be at the time. It was on a Sunday right before Election Day. So you can vote anywhere in Los Angeles County that has a, 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 a vote center if you want to do that. And so my staff has a resource page on our website. It outlines all the different Dropbox locations in the South Bay voting centers in my district. And, you know, so, so if you want to share that information, I just encourage also my colleagues to do the same. It's just important that people, there's enough craziness going on in the nation and the world right now. It's, you know, the, we want to make sure our constituents know the system. We want to make sure they know how it works. And we want to make sure they take advantage of it and they vote early, they get engaged, and they make sure their voice is heard. Uh, you know, uh, Senator Bradford talked about, about the, the economic challenges of the, of the economic crisis and, and the COVID crisis and, and, you know, talked a little bit about housing and, uh, and the challenges of, of our folks who are homeless. And he mentioned... Um, you know, there's obviously been a lot going on in the legislature about that topic. That's certainly been something that has really dominated our, our focus over the last year, as strange a year as it was. Uh, there was a, originally an eviction moratorium that Governor Newsom placed through executive order. And ultimately, we ended up with AB 3088, which is this bill that Assemblymember Chu signed that Senator Bradford talked a little bit about. Uh, basically, this is this temporary solution that's, that basically provides some set level of certainty to renters some modest protections for small landlords and also some more time to determine what additional relief might be needed in the future. Um, so, the, you know, basically for tenants, the law converts unpaid rent to consumer debt, which is then, you know, collectible in small claims court after the end of February um, uh, of, of the coming year. But basically, as long as you pay 25% of your rent, um, you know, as long as you have, a, if you have a, if you have a, a COVID Im impacted tenant, can, can avoid being evicted through, um, uh, through, through uh, the early spring. And, uh, and that's a way to keep people in their homes and, and, and prevent them from getting evicted. Um, there's also um, you know, some, some penalties if landlords try to uh, you know, shut off utilities to you know, force a tenant to va vacate uh, as long as they're complying with, uh, with, the, with their 25% rent minimum. Uh, so they'll, they'll, they'll have some penalties, but we also put in some protections for landlords, uh, we, we extended the existing homeowners bill of rights to small landlords, which basically, you know, gives them some additional protections with regards to their mortgagers. So that, um, you know, mortgage services have to contact borrowers before pursuing foreclosure proceedings um, in order to provide some, you know, potential forbearance options. Um, if, they're, if they're denied a forbearance, the, the you know, the, the law now requires the mortgage servicer to provide a written explanation of the decision. And, and there's, so there, and there's some additional anti-foreclosure protections that are put in place for small landlords that are in effect through the end of, uh, sorry, the, the January 1st, 2023. So there's some time. And then obviously, you know, there's some ballot measures on this topic, Prop 21, I'm sure everybody knows about that. will be interesting to see how that goes down. 
Um, I know that uh, uh, there are also some interest on this call about broadband. Uh, I know that was something you guys brought up to us that you wanted to talk a little bit about. I'm certainly really happy. I, I, I'm sure I join my, my colleagues in supporting your project. I, I really do remain very impressed with your work in developing a regional broadband fiber optic network for the South Bay. Super, super important, very important for economic development. Uh, on the legislative front, we, we expect there's, there's going to be several bills aimed at encouraging broadband deployment next year. Uh, the, the two main bills that were on this topic um, just didn't seem to get across the finish line this year. And I'm, I'm still trying to get the backstory. But um, you know, we had our colleague on the Senate side, Lena Gonzalez, had SB 1130, which would have allowed the state government to actively promote the transition of the state's legacy communications infrastructure into a multi-gigabit uh, fiber network that's you know, competitive and affordable and available to all uh, residents lacking high-speed access. And, and the bill you know, didn't make it out of the assembly. There was a lot of things going on. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, that, was, that, that, that I know we're, we're gonna come back with and we gotta sit down with all our colleagues on both sides in the governor's office to see if we can get that through. Um, AB, on the assembly side, there was AB 570 uh, that would have established new criteria where the state would have to uh, you know, had to prioritize cost-effective deployment of broadband, and and that didn't get that didn't get through either. But uh, but there's work happening right now. Um, I certainly expect legislation to you know to come forward to extend and reform CASF, the CASF, the California Advanced Services Fund, which is a program at the at the PUC at the Public Utilities Commission that funds broadband infrastructure de deployment. Um, the governor has also directed California Broadband Council to develop a new action plan. Uh, for broadband deployment, and, and, and that's going to you know, include specific recommendations for, you know, for supporting deployment of, of broadband. So um, I, it's, I think it's very possible that coming out of um, either the council or, or this fund, there's going to be some additional legislative recommendations that we, we're going to want to pick up on. Um, uh, obviously, uh, lots of interesting things happening on the environmental front. Um, you know, a lot, of the, a, lot of the, a lot of the crises that we face right now are, are actually de, de, closely related to our environmental challenges. Everything from, um, you know, the wet markets in China and, 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 the, and, you know, and, and the, in, in, in the, the, the implications and, and, and impact on COVID right the way over to our wildfires that of course are very closely tied to the challenges associated with climate change. And, you know, we're, we're trying to, we have some, some clean energy goals that the governor has announced relating to um, carbon-free energy sources and zero emissions vehicles on the road. Some of that is legislation that we've, uh, that we've passed and some of it is, is things that the governor has been, has been putting forward in, in, in various executive orders. And so there's some interesting work going on in that space. Um, I, I, you know, I also was glad to partner with so many of you in our cities to try to get some legislation passed on waste management. We know how much our cities are being impacted by the fact that the bottom has fallen out on the recycling market. I was just talking to a good friend on one of, one of the city councils who was talking about how the haulers are now coming back with pretty significant rate increase proposals uh, because of all the challenges in the waste management market. And um, so we, were, we all we came excruciatingly close to get a League of Cities sponsored bill across the finish line. We weren't quite able to get there. Um, think, I thank uh, uh, Senator Bradford for his support on that bill, but um, we're, we're, we're certainly determined to get there um, next year. And we, we're working very closely with the League of Cities on this issue. Uh, on, on, a, on another kind of environmental note, uh, Senator Stern and I, from the northern portion of, of my, my neck of the woods, we're going to be having a home safeguarding wildfire workshop. And I particularly want to invite our friends on the Hill, um, who, you know, where there is a very serious wildfire risk uh, to join us. It's going to be on Tuesday. I'm going to be streaming live on my Facebook page for anyone who'd like to join us. We'll, we'll put some information up on the chat, but we'd love to have um, particularly those of you who represent constituents who are in wildfire zones on, on, on the Palos Verdes Peninsula, would love you to, to, uh, to get the word out about that. It's gonna, we're gonna talk about home hardening. We're gonna talk about programs to assist people in, in uh, making sure that people are gonna be wildfire ready. Um, you, so obviously, uh, Senator Bradford talked a little bit about the budget. We've, we worked really hard to get ourselves into a place uh, that, you know, where, where we were able to keep the budget, um, you know, keep the money flowing in spite of the economic crisis. Uh, we were, I think, really, you know, ultimately because of Jerry Brown, because of the voters, because of the legislature's good work in the past, we were able to build a pretty significant rainy day fund, which allowed us to avoid the kinds of drastic measures that the legislature had to take the last go around. I don't know about you guys, but I was on the school board in my hometown in 2000. I, I was first elected in 2008, and I served right the way through the economic crisis after 2008. And it was a terrible experience in a lot of respects, because we were spending our entire time figuring out how to mitigate 
uh, and how to keep the programs going in spite of all the big cuts that we're facing at the state level. And the fact is that this time around- Excuse me, Senator. Excuse me, Senator. Um, uh, your 10 minute time limit is up. I'm right. afraid I'm gonna have to ask you to bring this part of your conversation to a close and ask if there are any questions for you. Okay. Now you can go ahead and finish your sentence. Oh, yeah, don't, no, just, just uh, I, I mean, I, anyway, I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate the good work that's gone into making sure that the budget has, has stayed sound and solvent. We still have some additional reserves. We didn't have to raise taxes on people. We didn't have to cut education. Um, the situation is certainly not good. But it was, it's a lot better than it would have been if, uh, if all of us together, all of us, certainly our cities, our state government hadn't done so much work in, in, in the past to save up. Um, so anyway, our doors are always open. I know my colleagues' doors are as well, and I'm looking forward to whatever questions people may have. Thank you. I think Jackie Bacharach has a question. Yeah. Well, first of all, I wanted to mention that I, um, I, whoever thought of ballot tracks was really wonderful. This is such a t terribly um, tense election season, it's so peculiar. And I put my ballot in one of those official ballot boxes and I got my uh, notice yesterday that it's been counted and it really, it caused me to feel a lot better. So it's a great system and I wanted to encourage people to use it. Uh, we're also going to be commenting on the governor's broadband council action plan as well to talk about what we're doing. So we are following that. But the one question I had and the one thing that always uh, we discuss all the time. I mentioned at the beginning, we're gonna have housing principles. Uh, one of the things we're concerned about is that the housing principle, housing legislation is done um, in its own silo. And it needs, we think it needs to be done understanding climate change and the existential threat from, from greenhouse gas emissions. And, and is there any chance that the legislature will look at these issues more comprehensively so that they really address all of your goals and not just some of your goals? That's a great question. And I got to say, I, I quite frankly have um, uh, I've been concerned about the tenor of the conversation in Sacramento. I think there's, there's so much frustration about the, the lack of, of housing affordability in the state that a lot of my colleagues have, I think, gotten to a point where they're willing to take much more drastic measures than they were before. Now, obviously, um, uh, uh, so, so that that that's kind of a that's a that's a that's a, an interesting tension point, and I I do want to encourage uh, you and you know, through the league and through contract cities and 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 other organizations, independent cities and others that you are involved with, uh, the COG, SCAG, etc., to to really start to to try to engage as much as you can in this debate. Um, I do think I mean the interesting thing is Jackie, the the proponents of the housing legislation, particularly housing density. Um, actually talk a lot about climate change, right? They talk about how they want to have more infill. They want to have people, you know, living more transit-oriented, transit-oriented development, transit-oriented housing. And so, uh, you know, bike, you know, bike-centered and transit-centered and, and, um, and reducing vehicle miles traveled and that kind of thing. Uh, so I do think that some of the, the climate conversations have entered into the, the broader housing conversations. From my perspective, what I'd like to see us do more of is try to figure out a balance between the need for greater housing production, but also the need for local elected officials to be able to set the standards for their own communities. And, uh, and, and that's gonna be a tricky thing to figure out. And I think it's gonna require some sacrifice on both sides. From my perspective, my colleague, Senator Wiener's SB 50 really did not, went, went way too far in the other direction. I don't think it gave, I mean, it literally unilaterally upzoned my, nearly my entire district with no input from, uh, from local, local folks who, who should have some input as to how their communities look and feel. But I will say, Jackie, they're using the environmental argument on this and there's some truth to it. I guess the question is, how do we figure out a, a formula? How do we figure out a model that will both um, uh, encourage more people, you know, once we get out of COVID, more people to get around in more environmentally friendly manners to encourage more density in those parts of the city, like downtown LA, for example, with, that really, are well suited for that kind of thing, um, while 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 allowing our local elected officials to to to, to retain control over uh, over over critical aspects of, of local life. And um, you know, to be honest, I, I don't think we've struck that balance yet. Uh, but the conversation continues, and I just want to I really want to uh, continue to encourage the cities, uh, you know, to engage, to really engage. And when I say engage, don't just come in with a no 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 attitude but come in with an attitude that's all about, okay, what goals do you have? What goals do we have? How do we figure out a way 
to come up with some mutually agreeable solutions. Thank you, Senator Allen. Are there any other questions for Senator Allen? Thank you so much, Senator Allen, for, uh, for joining us today. Um, ne next, we'll hear from Assemblymember Autumn Burke. Welcome, Assemblymember Burke. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Assemblymember Autumn Burke representing the 62nd Assembly District. Going third among my colleagues always means that I got to readjust everything I was getting ready to say. But the first thing I do really want to say is, is just like uh, Senator Allen said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry we can't be there all in person. Uh, it is one of the events I really enjoy and it's a great time for us all to get together. And I'm not sure how many of you know, but I had my own personal scare with COVID. Um, I contracted it while I was working at the Capitol during the budget. Uh, and I know how much our lives have been affected and I know what the stress um, has been like. And so it's important that we take these safety precautions. And I was lucky my experience was not as serious as most. Um, so all things considered, I am, I'm always blessed. I feel super blessed to be back on these conversations and to be having them again. Um, that said, I wanna actually refer to two things. Um, one, Jackie mentioned about, and Ann Ben actually mentioned about ballot tracks. It is really a great program, Jackie's right. For those who don't know about it or have it, I know they posted it in the chat. We've also put it on our Facebook and social media. Please repost it so that all your friends and family are using it. It, it really does create some comfort in this whole mail-in situation. So we wanna encourage people to use that. Um, also official ballot boxes are obviously very, very, very important. But also I wanted to mention, I know Jackie, the question wasn't for me, but I did wanna mention, um, we did do a few years ago of a transformative climate communities program. It's I think AB 277, something like that. And, and we saw, and it is a local working together of putting housing and environmental practices together. Watts did got $30 million from that program. They upgraded some low income housing and it was really community based, uh, local based. And it's a really great labor works together with it. It's a really, really, wonderful opportunity. It hasn't been getting as much funding in the last two years. We keep fighting for it and pushing for it to make sure it gets its ample funding. But it is one of those great opportunities where housing and environmental practices come together with locals and local government and grassroots um, environmentalists and folks. So I do want to point that out. And that also requires local hire and all of these great things. So I just wanted to mention that um, I know some of this legislation goes by years and we forget about it. And it is one of it is a great program and has worked out very very well for the locals who have used it in both Fresno and Watts. So that was that's just an aside on one of the questions. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was we did do some uh, with all the hard situation like uh, Senator Bradford mentioned throughout the year and having to reduce bills. We did have some great. Um, I'm the chair of Rev and Tax and we did we were able to pass some really great legislation this year. And I wanna make sure to mention a few of them. AB 1577, which was my small business tax relief bill that conforms state law to federal law by amending the revenue and tax code um, to exclude the gross income from the Paycheck Protection Program loan funds. This is important for our small businesses because it protects them from potentially having to pay thousands of dollars of unexpected state income tax. So that was the first thing we did. AB 3373, which is improves the efficiency of property tax assessment appeals process for both counties and taxpayers. This bill was in response to the surge of new appeals related to COVID-19 impact on property values. Um, it provides taxpayers with a better access to appeals boards and more timely resolutions. And we also had, uh, but in a totally different framework, speaking to some of the stuff that Brad, doctor, a doctor, I just gave you an upgrade, Steve, assembly member Bradford. <laughs> Our Senator Bradford mentioned is on our public safety front. Obviously this year was a really challenging year um, emotionally and for a lot of us members of the Black Caucus. Uh, and so my Black Caucus priority bill AB 846 was passed and signed. will um, update existing mental and emotional health screening materials for peace officers to include evaluations of implicit and explicit bias against race, ethnicity, gender, nationality, religion, disability, and sexual orientation. Um, what I tell people constantly is I know there's a lot of talk about demilitarizing the police. The reality is, is that starts with who you hire. And so making sure that those that we hire into that position are, are in the emotional state and are the right people for that job. And so that was a really important bill for myself and um, glad to have it as a Black Caucus priority. 
We had one more tax bill that that we passed that was will alleviate some stress off people, which is uh, 2660, which allows employers to file a group income tax return for their international business travelers who are ineligible under today's laws for an ITIN or an SSN. We go through this a lot um, in the capital. Um, this will provide some benefits to the business community by easing tax compliance, which we don't do a lot in California, but this was one of those times we got to do that. Also on the housing front that I know got brought up, I did do the right to housing. Um, as Senator Allen said, we've gotten more dramatic in how we try to deal with housing. Uh, I spent last year, this time last year, I spent the break traveling to states that had the right to shelter, learning what worked for them and learned what didn't work for them. Right to shelter they felt wasn't the answer, but right to housing was. Um, New York now has, New York City has less than 1% um, homeless. And so we went and looked at their programs, sat with both the advocates and the regulators to see what really was what worked and what didn't. And we created the right to housing bill that passed the Senate and the assembly, but was vetoed by the governor. I want to applaud you guys for the home sharing program because part of our right to housing was about prevention. And I think that that is New York City has shown that really the most economical way and the quickest way to relieve homelessness is prevention. And so that home sharing program, we wanna get involved with you on that. I'm so happy to hear about that. Um, you know, we're disappointed about that being vetoed, but uh, there were a lot of lessons learned. And I think we were so dramatic that, that hopefully some of the other things that were passed were passed partly because we were pushing so hard on, on such a dramatic bill. Um, I'm trying to think what else we have. The Digital Divide, I sit on the Digital Divide Task Force. I want to thank you for all the work you're doing there and please contact our office. We are working very closely with Tony Thurman um, and we meet once a month on that. Uh, we're seeing progress, but obviously we have a long way to go. So please make sure to stay in contact with our offices as you're developing your programs with and what you need and what you are doing. Um, we are working closely also with uh, Cecilia Aguiar Curry, who was, was the other author, was the assembly author to the Senate bill Lena Gonzalez was working on. Um, I have heard ad nauseum what the issues were <laughs> with that situation and hopefully we'll get that resolved over the next uh, two months. We're helping work with her to, to see if we can get one bill that both houses really feel confident about moving forward. And I think that's incredibly important. Uh, other than that, I just, I thank you all. I thank you all for everything you are doing. Obviously what happens on the federal level is going to have a great impact on what our next year looks like. So um, we are kind of standing at the ready to with that information. And then I think how we move forward from there is going is is what we're waiting for at this point. But. We are working obviously on a lot of the um, EO, like uh, Senator Allen mentioned on the electric vehicle, uh, or I don't wanna say electric vehicle, I wanna say zero emission vehicle because I think there's a lot of technologies that, that fall into that zero emission possibility. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that for a lot of people in the 62nd district, a uh, electric vehicle is out of the price range, whereas um, a hydrogen fuel vehicle on the secondhand market are now 10 to $13,000, which becomes much more accessible and that, and that infrastructure is not a rate-based infrastructure. So I think we have to make sure that we look at a lot of different options when we come, when we have that conversation. I know we have an executive order, but the legislative branches uh, are equal branches and need to make sure that our voices and our constituents are heard in that conversation. So with that, I will just open it up for questions. Thank you. Are there questions for the assembly member? Um, Jackie has a question. Well, you just, you just sparked something in me in the last thing you said. We have a, a Caltrans funded grant for a local travel network. The local travel network is to create safe spaces for slow speed vehicles, because we agree with you, electric vehicles are not the only answer. What we've learned is neighborhood electric vehicles, scooters, electric bikes, um, regular bikes. There's ways of getting around for very short trips, which are 70% of the trips in the South Bay. And so we're trying to create a network of streets that would be safer for these vehicles. And we think people would buy them if they felt that they had safe places to ride. So I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, no, and thank you. And it's important, and by the way, to what Senator Allen said as well, we need your voice in all this, um, especially when it comes to this new zero emission vehicle conversation. It is a much larger, much more comprehensive conversation than just a zero emission vehicle conversation. Obviously we are um, up in Sacramento, they are getting ready to shut, do shut power shutdowns because of wind and fire. 
And all of these things are very much tied together. The stability of the grid is all, this is all tied together. And so for once, I'm really hoping that we do a much more comprehensive conversation, not just one about electric vehicles, not just one about the grid, not just one about transportation, but how we all tie it all together. It's not what we do at the Capitol in tradition, but I'm hoping that uh, with all these great, you know, like with that, with Ben and Steve there and all these great members that I think it's a great time to start moving how we look at things and we can look at things in a more holistic, comprehensive way. Thank you, uh, John, John, John. Thank you. John Krukshank has a question. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, Assemblywoman, thank you for being here today. I don't think we've ever met. I, I know you don't represent Rancho Palos Verdes. Uh, but you and I are fellow COVID survivors. Um, <laughs> Good, glad to hear that. Uh, I'm so glad to hear that your symptoms were not as bad as so many others. Um, but we haven't talked about it so much. Um, but of course, the COVID shutdowns are something that are affecting all of us in the state. And um, you know, we do hear from the governor all the time, but we never really hear from the legislators, and they're maybe push to have us find ways to live with the COVID versus just shutting everything down all the time. And so I'd love to know if there's any type of activity going on because, you know, certainly in our city and many, many, all the cities really, um, the shutdowns are affecting all of us in many, many ways. So I just wondered if there's an opportunity for you as someone that's gone through the experience to help us with at least finding ways to live with it more. Um, first, I am, Glad to hear that, that you are well. Uh, I know it's a vulnerable feeling getting COVID because it's just one of those, it's such an unknown that it, it creates a lot of vulnerability and it's created a lot of vulnerability in our economy. And quite clearly, this is a recession that's unprecedented because the reality is we have no modeling for how we recover from something like this where we have an artificial shutdown. And I understand, and also as a single mom of a six-year-old, as Ben mentioned, I completely, I mean, right now she's not here, thank God. Otherwise you would see a child whizzing by. So I am more than aware of, of all of the challenges, like you said, as someone who, uh, not just as a single mom, but as a COVID survivor. And I wish, I'm gonna be honest with you, I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, and I am, since you don't know me, for those who do know me, they know I'm extremely straightforward. So you might brace yourself, um, but, <laughs> Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of the COVID, we did our COVID bills and we've done bills, but the reality is, is, is this search situation is an emergency situation or has been, I, I think it's moved out of the emergency situation and into a situation where legislatures, legislators should be more involved. However, the governor has pretty much taken over this process, in my opinion, I'm going to, because I don't want to plant my, my fellow uh, legislators on with this brush. In my opinion, he has taken over this conversation in totality. And um, I don't think that we've actually been as much a part of it as we probably should. Um, I know that I have offered my conversation and I have a good relation. I have a really good relationship with the governor, the governor's office. And I have offered as someone who has experienced it, um, I have offered my services to have that conversation. I have had it on a very surface level, but I do hear what you're saying and it's hard, you wanna, you want, I wanted my daughter back at school. Um, her doctor explained to me that really the, the risks of her getting it are so much lower than the emotional risk of her not being around her, her classmates. I know that UC Davis has converted levels of their hospital into mental wards because mothers and children are now being admitted at such a high rate that they are, and they are medicating mothers and children because the anxiety and stress from this situation has been enormous. They don't have beds for their traditional sur surgeries on some level. Um, so I don't, unfortunately, I wish the legislators had more control and opportunity in this. Our opportunity is very limited to when we're in session. I know that a lot of members wanted to come back to special session, but the governor must call special session, which of course takes away some power from him when we come back, because we're back to equal levels of government. So um, I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, I think the transition is going to be slow. I know our, I know the cap, or at least our side is talking about they may not return until there's a vaccine. And if that's the attitude, then yes, life is not going to go back to normal for a very long time. It's going to take a while. 
Um, in the meantime, I know what kind of stresses emotionally and, and financially that puts on families and emotionally. So my hope is, and I know what we're doing in our family is, you know, as school goes back, we are trying to be safe, but we're sending our, I'm sending my daughter back to school. We're starting to very carefully, my daughter wears a shield and a mask when we go places, but I'm starting to take her back out because I want to spend my money out with my, out in my community where they need the help and where small business needs the um, support. I encourage everyone to do the same. It's not just restaurants, it's stores. I love my Amazon, but, and I use it constantly. But I encourage you all to, to really go to your local stores. They need the support now more than ever. And I know it's scary. Please be careful when you do it, wear a mask, clean your hands. But right now, I don't know that Gavin Newsom's gonna have all the answers right now. I think that right, it's really gonna be important that we support each other. And I know we're doing that in our local neighborhoods, but I think we, we need to really take a moment each week and each day and remember that, that we're kind of all in this together. And the more we focus on that and the more we try to make sure we support each other, whether that is watching a friend's kids with some social distancing so they can get away or uh, going to your local store, I think that really that's gonna be the best we can do right now. Thank you so much, uh, Assembly Member Burke. Um, I think we have to move on now. Um, I understand Assembly Member Gibson is here. Assembly Member Mike Gibson. Yes, good morning. Good morning. How are you, Ms. Valentine? Good to see I'm you. I'm fine, how are you? I'm, I'm doing well and to everyone here, to my colleagues. I'm very grateful to have an opportunity to be with you. Uh, once more and again, um, as my colleagues have said, I've listened to uh, the dialogue. Uh, we love and enjoy being together in that big room at the big table, um, but this pandemic has uh, controlled the agenda. And I know that my colleague Autumn Burks talked about COVID and her being a COVID survivor. Um, the narrative is that we're no longer in control. Uh, COVID-19 is in control of everything that we do and say um, here moving forward. And trying to get back to a sense of normalcy, uh, we don't know when that's going to be. I don't think Washington, D.C. know when that's it's going to be. Uh, I don't think even the doctors and the scientists know when that's going to be. And even if they do give us a, 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 a particular a cure or a vaccine, I think people are going to be very skeptical in terms of rushing to take it. Um, and so I just wanted to, uh, you know, just weigh in that um, this is our new normal for a while. And as much as we don't wanna be, uh, try to accept it, it is. And so uh, I wanna blend some of my comments on the question that was asked of John to Autumn Burke. Um, the, the governor needs to share power um, and we need to be part of the decision-making process moving forward and where we have not been. We're good to, um, to pass money, um, but the, the big decisions are not being made along with equal uh, authority, equal partners in this, in this effort. And so that uh, troubles me uh, greatly. And so with that, even though we had to focus on, I had a number of bills um, that we had to abandon uh, because it, wasn't, it was not COVID related. Um, I had 29 bills. I started out with 29 bills uh, this year, 2020, um, and we had to do an assessment on those bills because it was told to us by our appropriation chair in the assembly um, and others that we we're gonna deal when we return, we we're gonna deal with uh, COVID related bills. But there were some, also some, bill, some, ish, some bills around social justice um, that needed to be moved forward based on the uh, murder and execution of George Floyd uh, Brianna Taylor and many others and people and Mr. Valenzuela who was nearby um, and Santa Ana who was uh, killed by Santa Ana police. Um, his family received an award of $33.1 million. But let me simply underscore this. That doesn't bring back that person. That person is gone forever. And the money can never erase the memory of of those two children who lost their father. And so looking at the social justice equity that we had to deal with, those are bills that the legislature as well as the wildfires 
had to address. And so I had to, uh, Madam Chair Valentine, advance some bills that I'm happy to report uh, that got out of the legislative, got through the legislative process and that the governor signed Assembly Bill um, 901. Assembly Bill 901, it was a juvenile justice bill. And that bill simply, you may not know this, but if kids are missing truant from school, um, probation can automatically, voluntarily, underscore voluntarily place you on probation. Um, and when you are voluntary, if you're voluntary, I should be able to get out anytime I want to if it's voluntary. And what people have found out and the parents that I've spoken to, it wasn't voluntary. Uh, a probation officer can do search and seizure anytime, not only of the, per of, the of the child's person, but also going into that child's home. And again, the child has not broken any laws, but has been treated as a criminal. And what that has caused is trauma, not only trauma on the child, but also trauma with the family as well, who don't have means to, oh, to take probation to court and fight this in the court. And so what we did was we offered up Assembly Bill 901 that, um, that basically allows probation to focus on those who have in fact broken laws, who needs to be on probation, needs the guidance, needs the oversight, opposed to those who have never broken any laws. So the governor believed, as I believed, and the stakeholders, I'm very grateful working with those stakeholders in terms of juvenile justice, we got that bill passed and governor signed that bill and that bill will be enacted on January the 1st, 2021. In addition to that, we have toiled for almost three years with Assembly Bill uh, 1544. And I wanna be mindful of the time, Chairwoman Valentine, so just keep me on task, um, really appreciate it. And so uh, firefighters and myself who's a sponsor of Assembly Bill uh, 1544, we stopped, started, we held the bill in the Senate until the governor appointed um, a director of this department to implement this, this bill. And what a 1544 would simply do is that the, the law says, even right now until this bill goes in effect, January 1, 2021, the law says if anyone calls 911 and uh, paramedics reports to the scene for someone being intoxicated under the influence of drugs, someone suicidal, you must take that individual to the emergency room. You must. What that does is those individuals are sitting there, sitting there, not only um, uh, detriment to themselves, to the trauma, but also to personnel. Because if you have someone on drugs, I've seen a number of people uh, lose it and hurt people waiting in the waiting room to be seen by a healthcare professional. Not to mention, uh, it ties them up. When you deal with emergency, emergencies are for gunshots, for strokes, for heart attacks, those critical things. So if someone is under the, um, is intoxicated, and paramedics reports, reports to the scene, they're now taken to a sobering center. A sobering center, not to an emergency room where they're gonna sit there um, and possibly go off, um, um, sit there for hours until they're being seen because again, personnel is dealing with those who are emergency issues. So if you're intoxicated, you go into a sobering center. The second one is that if you are suicidal, having a mental breakdown or under the influence of drugs, Instead of you going to the emergency room, sitting there and actually blowing up, you're now being transported to a behavior health center, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, specialist addressing your health, your mental health issue that you're dealing with right then and there. So I'm happy to say that the governor signed that bill 1540, 40, um, excuse me, 1544, and that bill will be enacted January 1st, 2021. In addition to that bill, uh, the governor also signed my bill, Kobe, I call it the Kobe Bryant bill. Everyone understood that day when we all heard the horrific news that Kobe Bryant, his daughter um, and others went down in the helicopter. But what you didn't find out until later is that our trusted first responders, um, meaning our sheriff's department took pictures of the horrific uh, scene um, and also the remains um, and uh, used that for their own personal entertainment. How would you like to, how would you like finding out that your loved one just was murdered, killed in a horrific accident by social media? No one wants to get that news and receive that news in that kind of manner. And so what this bill would do is prohibit any of our first responders from taking such photographs 
Um, if you are not in the corner or the lead detectives, uh, you are prohibited from taking pictures. If you do, you are also fined um, and it's a misdemeanor. Um, we also, we're trying to do jail time and that's the art of negotiations. And uh, we negotiated <coughs> uh, that because um, a number of people, including the governor's office, <coughs> thought it was very punitive, but we wanted to send a strong message. And it would be a blemish on a, on a first responder's record if in fact you were found guilty um, and charged with this misdemeanor of doing such crime, doing such a, uh, a crime like this. And so again, the governor signed Assembly Bill 2655. I call it again, the Kobe Bryant Bill. Um, 2960, um, the city of Los Angeles, the mayor Garcetti asked me to carry this bill and I did happily. What it does is um, people have a number of buildings and dwellings that they want to convert into homeless shelters or, sh or yeah, homeless shelters. And you have to go through CEQA and a whole bunch of different other things. What this bill would do, basically already existing building, all you need is a fire marshal to go and inspect the place, sign off on it, and it's done. That cuts through the red tapes and allow us to be able to convert existing um, um, dwellings, uh, meaning buildings into shelters um, to address the, uh, the overwhelming amount of people who are on our streets um, during um, this crisis that we find excuse ourselves. me, excuse me, assembly member, your time has expired. Um, can, uh, and uh, I'd like to just ask if anyone has any questions for you. I hope they asked me about 1196. 1196. Somebody asked me about 1196. <laughs> Does any do are there questions for assembly member Gibson? Tell us about 1196. Thank you very much. <laughs> the uh, real quick. Um, the, we, um, this is part of the justice package of the Legislative Black Caucus. Uh, I carried 1196, basically banning chokeholds and karate in California. The governor signed that bill that bans law enforcement from using the karate art of restraints. That's the method that was used to kill George Floyd and also mm -hmm. chokeholds. Um, so both of those, those, both of those techniques will be banned in the state of California. That law goes in effect January 1, 2021. I'm very happy. And the Legislative Black Caucus was behind that bill. And I was happy to be the author. And thank you very much for asking me that question. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? Thank you so much, Assembly Member Gibson. Thank you. Be blessed. Be safe. Um, is Assembly Member Al Mur Murasachi here? Suchi. Marisu no, well, but uh, Andrew DeBlock is here. Just representing. He's representing him? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, is Andrew? Andrew? Good morning, I'm here. Okay. Go ahead, Andrew. Thank you so much. And again, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone virtually on behalf of Assembly Mayor Murasuchi. I think we all miss the days of, of being together in person. And these are not quite the same, but it's nice to see friendly faces at least in, in this, these days. So um, I'll be very brief. Our, our legislators have done a fantastic job providing a general update on the context and the cycle and the time of a pandemic. Um, but I will focus on a couple of bills. Mr. Murtsuchi also had a truncated and much more than usual bill package as a result of um, the restrictions due to the pandemic. But I want to focus on one bill in particular that's especially salient to this group, which is um, Assembly Bill 1286, uh, focusing on shared mobility. Um, we've talked about this bill for quite some time. It's, it's been a multi-year effort to ensure that companies aren't just dropping um, these shared mobility devices, these scooters in cities without first coming to agreement with municipalities. And we saw that largely in our beach cities um, and, and working with um, both providers and our local governments, we were able to, to come to an agreement this year. And so just wanted to highlight that bill finally got done this year and got signed by the governor. And so thank you to everyone on this call that worked with us so closely on that legislation. Um, also want to highlight the fact that even though the assembly members district office is currently closed physically, we are still open. We know these are very, very difficult times for folks. And so many of us constituents are now dealing with EDD and other issues, securing benefits. Please, please, you constituents that are, 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 focused, that are, are facing this issue, share them with me personally or with the office. We're here to help and help navigate that process. We want to make sure that folks have every resource available to them in these really trying times. Um, also want to share that the assembly member is still doing um, his best effort to engage with the community. We're doing community coffees virtually in every city in the district. So if you haven't already had yours, um, there's one coming. Um, the next one is going to be in folks in the city of Torrance. And that's going to be on the 21st, starting at 6 p.m. 
And I will drop a link uh, to that in the chat, though it's focused on Torrance. Obviously, anyone is welcome to, to join. It's a virtual conversation. Um, also want to focus on um, legislative priorities that, that may not be bill numbers or things that he's still still very focused on. First of all, education funding has been a top priority for the ACLU member. He fought really hard with many of the folks on this call to ensure that districts were held harmless as a former school board member and someone who also served during the last recession on a school board. He understands how important it is to have schools have full funding, especially as we try to reopen our economy safely. That's going to be a key component. So just want folks to know that he continues to focus on that as a top priority as well as environmental issues. He did author a bill, Assembly Bill 345, that though it was not signed by the governor, didn't pass out of legislature, um, focused on oil well setbacks and ensuring that our communities are, are safe and are, 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 we're being responsible when it comes to where we're sourcing things like our, our oil drilling sites. And so though that bill did not pass, um, he's still focused on that issue. And it looks like there's going to be some good rulemaking coming out of CalGEM and the, the executive branch. So I wanted folks to know that that's an ongoing fight as well. And, and we're focused on that. And I want to be cognizant of the time, so I'll leave it there. But please know that we are here to assist if anything ever comes up in the 6th District. And uh, again, I will drop a link in the chat to his, his, his next community coffee where folks can engage them personally if they choose to do that. Thank you so much, Sois. Thank you, Andrew. Next, we'll hear from um, Assembly Member Patrick O'Donnell. No, uh, no, Patrick O'Donnell's person actually had to leave, but we have Senator Holly Mitchell's representative, Lily Safani. Safiani. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting us. It's, my name is Lily Sofiani, and um, I'm the district representative for Senator Holly Mitchell. <clears throat> I cover housing, homelessness, and the aging population. So a lot obviously has happened this year. I'll go pretty quickly. Um, so the Capitol Office has uh, been very much focused this past year on two legislative bills. Um, you might know Senator Holly Mitchell is the chair of California's budget. So she dedicated much of her time to passing the budget for the upcoming year. Um, so I'll go over very quickly and the two bills that she authored. I'll just very quickly go over those before I move on to um, what the district office has been up to. So Senator Holly Mitchell, along with the Ledge team in Sacramento, authored <clears throat> SB 555. Uh, her, her main focus this past year was criminal justice reform. Um, and the two bills that she authored were focused on, on justice reform. So one of them was SB 555, uh, which was, um, which would have been a cap on the amount of fees that incarcerated folks are forced to pay in order to make phone calls to their families. Uh, that bill was actually vetoed by the governor. So we're working on the language and bringing it back. Um, that is definitely not going to just end there. <laughs> uh, the second bill that she authored was SB 144, uh, fees, oh, sorry, families over fees. This is again, a justice reform bill and it has 23 bills inside of it, which will save over $180 million for uh, families of color and families who are related to people who are incarcerated who have to pay for all the fees um, that incarcerated folk have placed upon them um, while they are in prison, but also um, once they leave in probationary periods. Uh, so SB 144 did pass and um, Senator Holly Mitchell has also, aside from chairing the budget, also chairs the COVID-19 COVID Health Committee. Um, so she's, the ledge team in Sacramento, along with the Senator, have placed a great amount of um, time and energy on um, a budget to include health and uh, wellness and basically getting housing, homelessness, everything uh, with, in relation to COVID-19. Um, so the Senator passed $600 million for Project Room Key, which was the project in which we had uh, hotels and motels in Los Angeles County, where we placed uh, the most vulnerable people experiencing homelessness um, over the age of 60. 
uh, do, when the pandemic started in, in order to isolate them and make sure that uh, COVID doesn't spread uh, in the streets and that we don't um, have high rates of, of death and illness among our unhoused population. So Project Room Key as of today, I mean, in the last six months, they housed over 4,000 people experiencing homelessness. But as of today, that, that project has come to an end and they are demobilizing the hotels and motels and moving those folks into permanent supportive housing, rapid rehousing, and uh, shelter beds if none is available. So now another piece has passed, which is $40 million to Los Angeles County from the state budget. Uh, and and this, this round is called Project Home Key rather than Project Room Key. So it's moving those folks from the hotels into actual housing. Um, she also passed another $300 million. I'm sorry, I have, to, I have to stop you here. Your time has expired. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for bringing this to us. Um, are there any le other legislators here or their representatives? There is one question. All right, I have a qu uh, there's a question. Brit? Yes, uh, uh, Britt Huff, Rolling Hills Estates. Uh, I see Senator Allen is still online, so I wanted to see if I could do a follow-up question with him. Uh, thank you for raising the issue of um, the increasing costs of waste management and um, I, um, uh, resulting from the loss of our our uh, partners who were recipients of recycling in the past, particularly China. Do you hear of uh, any uh, developments or proposals at the state or national level to uh, creative solutions to this problem? Uh, well, yes. I mean, we, I, you know, I've been very involved um, with this and, and, and with the League of Cities uh, who have been very supportive and helpful. We're basically trying to figure out a system that will bring more coherence to the way that products and packaging come through our system. And you know, there's obviously been a huge uptick in, pla in single use plastic waste. And there are things that we can do to make the plastic, uh, first of all, reduce waste, reduce source reduce. I mean, there's a lot of plastic out there that is literally provides very minimal uh, benefit to a consumer. Uh, but creates a lot of problems for our cities and for our, our, our haulers and our ratepayers. And there's also things we can do to make sure that the plastic that does make its way through and all the, all the products are more likely to be recycled or be able to be reused. And um, that's ultimately what we're trying to do here. It, it, it's about trying to inject some more responsibility into the producer, who ultimately are the ones who have the tools at their disposal. I mean, at the end of the day, those of us in government or the haulers or the recyclers or the landfill people, all we can do is take the waste that we're given. <clears throat> and the people who are actually putting these products out there have literally no incentive, no accountability. There's no reason for them to even think about the end use of the product because you know, they have no responsibility associated with it. And so that's, that's ultimately what we're really trying to focus on. How do we, um, how do we uh, basically put in place a, a system that will push the producers toward thinking a little bit more about the end use of their products through some sort of uh, you know, producer responsibility system. And how do we do it in a way, of course, that, you know, that, that won't you know, substantively disrupt the market, that will make sure that all of the various players in the system um, feel as though they're gonna be able to do their work. And so it's, it's been difficult to figure out exactly how to craft it, but we're, we're deep into this. There's actually gonna be a ballot measure on the ballot um, in 2022 that Recology has put on the ballot um, that phases out uh, styrofoam, for example, uh, mm -hmm. and that puts a little bit of a fee on various types of non-recyclable single-use plastics. That could either go, to, that apparently polls very well, that could go to the ballot or it could spark a negotiated settlement along the lines of what we were talking about. Now, as you know, Britt, um, the legislature has the right to, to sort of pull back ballot measures and try to see if we can negotiate a deal. Um, and then if not, of course, the ballot measure will go onto the ballot. So this is gonna be a very, very active space uh, over the next two years. And uh, one thing I think we need to do is make sure that our, our friends in our cities are continuing to let their legislators know. A lot of the legislators were in local government, but before China you know, put in place National Sword. And so they don't really, they're not aware of how much city governments are, are starting to get hit in a major way by this crisis. City of LA, for example, used to make, used to actually make about $5 million alone 
just mm -hmm. off of the three through seven plastics. Now they're having to spend, they're losing a, a million dollars out of general fund dollars just to offload this stuff and meet their diversion requirements and everything else. So there's a, been a huge shift in this area. The cities know it. The legislature, I think, is still still needs to get educated. And, and, um, and that doesn't even start to talk about the environmental impacts of all this stuff. So this is going to be a very active space over the next two years. And we, I, I very much welcome your engagement. Thank you Thanks. so much. Um, we have to move on. Um, uh, I think we're now going to hear from the League of California Cities. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Olivia. Uh, thank Good morning. you for having me. I, I, I know you all didn't come here to, uh, to listen to me, but I do want to give you a, a quick update on some of uh, the activities that the League has done. Uh, we did just have a, uh, our, our first virtual annual conference. Uh, that event took place over three days last week. Uh, and we saw actually quite a lot of attendees, virtual, the, we're adapting and adjusting to this virtual world. Um, and uh, we had 1600 people nearly uh, participating. So that was, that was really good. And I know I've heard a lot of good feedback uh, about how that, uh, how that conference went. Um, so I just wanted to, to put that out there. If you did uh, register for that event, you can still go back and watch it for the next six months or so um, on, uh, on our website. So that's good. Um, another thing that the league has been working on, obviously the legislation uh, that passed this year, there was a lot, uh, some much fewer bills that actually made it across the finish line. Uh, some of the big things that happened, SB 1441 uh, by McGuire uh, allows cities to, have, uh, to recover their UUT for those um, wireless, prepaid wireless. Uh, that's something that uh, every few years we have to re-up. We haven't been able to get a bill across the finish line in the legislature that just will do that automatically, but they keep sunsetting it, so we keep passing it through. So obviously I want to thank Senator McGuire for his work on that. I know that does affect, uh, I believe, Inglewood and a few of the other cities who have a, a UUT out there. Um, AB 992 by Assemblymember Mullen uh, that modernizes the Brown Act uh, tweak some of the rules around social media. Uh, that was another good one that we were following. Uh, AB 434 daily, daily uh, it sort of aligns rental housing uh, programs uh, so that uh, you don't have to go searching around for where, uh, where all these, these funds, uh, these uh, pools of money are. Uh, of course, local assembly member Al Maritsuchi authored uh, 1286, which the league co-sponsored, uh, really helps get a hold on some of these shared mobi mobility devices so they can't just drop in and uh, put, uh, put these scooters everywhere in a city without coming to the city first. So that's certainly, certainly good. Um, otherwise, we've been working on, uh, obviously the census unexpectedly ended yesterday after a few uh, back and forth, we've been working on that. Uh, we've also been working on uh, this upcoming uh, election and making sure people know exactly how to uh, to cast their ballot and where to find all that information. Uh, the league is supporting Proposition 20 uh, and opposing uh, Measure J on the LA County uh, ballot. Um, so I'm happy to, to speak about that if anyone has any questions. But the uh, also I know there was some disagreement between some of between the statewide league uh, and, and some of the cities. So. I would encourage any of the, the city staff out there or council members who are interested. Uh, we're doing uh, policy committees right now. That, those applications are open for about the next month or so. Uh, so we're certainly interested in getting you engaged, uh, getting you uh, active with the league, and we'll try to, to bring the conversation back so it more reflects the, the, uh, the needs of the South Bay. So that's all I have. I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions for Jeff? Can I, can I just ask about the mustache? <laughs> yes, it's my COVID mustache. <laughs> I, I'm getting a haircut today for the first time in about two months too. So I'm very excited to, to maybe clean up my act a little bit. It's looking good, it's looking good. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Thank you very much, Jeff. Now, now is the time for a discussion and public comment. Are there any is there anybody who would like to uh, discuss anything we've heard today or are there any issues that were not taken up that you last minute issues that you'd like to discuss or uh, questions you have for any of the remaining legislators who are here? I see no hands. 
And seeing no hands, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Thank you all, thank you all to all the legislators who came today. We really enjoyed your discussion and uh, we look forward to your continued participation with us. I encourage all of the, um, the cities that are here to keep in touch with your own legislators and let them know uh, what, your, um, what your concerns are and keep in touch with us and keep in touch with the league. So with that, I'm going to adjourn this meeting to Thursday, January 14th, 2021. Everyone have a wonderful, happy holiday in spite of COVID. Enjoy, and uh, we'll see you next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the email, Jeff. <laughs>